Okay, uh, so this is our second density management lecture following up on the first density management lecture. And so what we're really going to focus on in this one, on the first density management lecture, it focuses on um, what are the impacts of thinning on a stand. And so we can understand the impacts of a thinning on a stand. But what we're focused on with this is the tools that we need to decide, should I thin the stand? When should I thin the stand? How much should I thin the stand? So those are the questions we're answering in this lecture. So why don't you go ahead and split up into groups and say a landowner has a bottom land hardwood stand like the one in that picture. Um, and they're just asking you, does this need to be thinned? And you put in a couple plots and you get some basic data. There's 160 trees per acre. There's 120 square feet per acre of basal area. And the average tree size is 12 inches, okay? And so just come up with two answers. Should it be thinned or not? Yes or no? And why? explain why you think it should be thin or why you don't think it should be thin. And then come up here and jot down a, a short version of your answer up on the board. Okay, so this worked out pretty well. You can see your responses up here. So we had eight groups. Four of you said thin the stand. Four of you said don't thin the stand. Um, and then the group saying that the stand should be thinned generally listed ecological reasons why the stand should be thinned. Um, the group saying the stand shouldn't be thinned, um, most of you were saying you don't know the landowner objective. If this was a real scenario, what would you do? You would ask the landowner what their objective is. You would need to know that. So that, that's a good point. Um, and then you have a few other reasons um, where you know most of these trees may be soft timber, so you can keep growing them as soft timber possibly. Um, or, you know, hardwoods have a longer rotation, which is true. Um, but again, we don't know the age on that stand, right? We know the structure, you don't know the age. But, you know, here, here's sort of the take home message from this. It's not that I'm giving you the, the correct answer here. As a group of almost foresters, should we be 50 50 split on whether to thin a stand like this or not? Assuming you had the objectives? Hopefully we're all coming to similar conclusions, right? Hopefully, you know, there's good rationale, rationale behind what we're gonna do here. We might not all find it exactly the same, um, but uh, again, hopefully we can build more consensus than this. So that's sort of the point of this exercise. We need the tools to be able to do that. And so that's gonna be the purpose of this lecture. Let me get the Zoom share screen going again. Okay, um, and so the, the, the basically the rest of this lecture, we're going to go through a number of different tools uh, that you'll be able to use to look at that data and say, yes, we should thin it, here's why, or no, we shouldn't thin it. And these tools are really focused on the ecology. Uh, you will need the objectives, but with the ecology, this is hopefully a review of biometrics. So we've got some basic terms here. Stand density is what is actually out in a forest. So during timber cruising week, you went out into the forest, you put in either plots or points. And by the time you got back, hopefully you had good numbers on here's how many trees per acre were out there. Um, here's the basal area out there. Here's the tons per acre that are out in that stand. So you all should know pretty well how to get stand density. Stand density has no opinion in it, right? It's just, this is what's out there right now in this particular forest. Stocking now, we interject some expert opinions in there. And so you're looking at how much we think should be out there. So you could express it on a percent occupancy of that site. Um, it could be expressed as, you know, a basal area out there based on how much we think that stand can hold, crown competition factors, or a relative density. And so we're going to use this concept of relative density where you take the absolute stand density. So we went and measured, and this is how many trees per acre there are but you compare them to some reference level, okay? And so with that reference level, is the landowner gonna tell you how many trees per acre to leave on a stand? No, they're not. They'll have their objectives, but they probably won't know what trees per acre or basal area meet those objectives. So when you look at stocking, it's gonna be an expert system. 
a landowner will tell you, I want an open woodland, so I've got good aesthetics. Or the objective for this property is red cockaded woodpecker habitat management. So you know the species and we know from the literature, here are the basal areas that will meet that objective. Or they'll tell you they wanna manage for timber. So they'll give you the objective. And from that, you need to figure out, okay, here's what the stand needs to look like to meet that objective. So you're gonna use the, the literature to come up with answers to that. And so stocking is not defined by the landowner per se, it's gonna be more of an expert informed system. Part of it's based on the ecology. You can only get stocking so high. So here's basal areas in a couple different units for you, square feet per acre and square meters per hectare. But we have different types of trees, shade tolerant or shade intolerant examples of both conifers and our deciduous hardwood trees. Now our conifers here tend to have a decurrent or sorry, they tend to have an X current crown form. They have one main stem up the middle, so they have a narrow crown. Many of our angiosperms tend to have a D current crown form. So they have a wide branching crown. Think about a post oak growing out in an old field, you know, look outside these windows at any of these cherry bark oaks, they have a large wide branching crown. So you can fit generally more conifers per acre than hardwoods because of that crown morphology. You can fit more shade tolerant trees per acre than intolerant trees, because the individuals in the lower crown classes aren't dying because they can tolerate that shape. So if you have a shade tolerant evergreen, you know, it wouldn't be surprising to see a coastal redwood stand carrying 200 square feet per acre of basal area because it's very shade tolerant and it has one main stem, a narrow crown. Um, if you have upland oaks here in East Texas, it wouldn't be surprising to have them at a much lower basal area. Think about where we went uh, for week six dendro lab out at that site that has all the trash on it and the, the old grown up pipelines, you know, that stand is probably at a basal area of, you know, 60, 70 square feet per acre. And it's dominated by shade intolerant hardwoods and it's a very xeric site. So you're gonna get different trees stocking at different levels. So let, let's look at five tools that we can use to answer that question at the beginning of class here. Should we thin a stand or not? So SDI, you went over in biometrics, this should be review but SDI will then use to calculate relative density. And once we understand SDI and relative density, we'll apply them just in a diagram. It's the same concepts, we're just putting them on a diagram. That's a stand density management diagram. Then we'll take a separate approach and use some crown competition factors. So looking at different sizes of crowns and create a Gingrich style stocking chart. And so we'll go over those today. And those are the two tools you're gonna to be developing in lab this week. You're gonna be working with a stand density management diagram and you're gonna create your own Gingrich style stocking chart. We'll wrap it up with live crown ratio. It's a very simple tool, but it's not really the perfect tool, but we can use it occasionally. Okay, so a guy named Reinecke came up with stand density index in 1933. And stand density index is getting at the idea of just how many trees we can fit on an acre of land. Reinecke's SDI is really intended to be applied to pure stands and even age stands. So ideally we're looking at all one species, all one age class. So very simple forests. But what it is, it's trees per acre times the quadratic mean diameter divided by 10 raised to the 1.605 power. So that 10 and that 1.605 are not arbitrary. So let's look at where they came from. 10 is the average diameter of the stand in inches. So we're using a reference of a 10 inch stand. So think about site index for a moment and we can draw an analogy with site index. So for plantations, we use a site index age of 25 years. So we might have a 10 year old stand, we might have a 30 year old stand. We can compare the quality of those sites and the management on them by saying, how tall would those trees have been or will those trees be at 25 years? So we can compare different age stands at an index age. SDI is basically comparing stands of different densities and different tree sizes at a standard tree size, okay? So say I have a Lavalie pine stand with a thousand two inch trees per acre. And say I have another Lavalie pine stand with 50 20 inch trees per acre. Which of those has more stocking? Which of those is best fully occupying the site and using all the site resources? That's a really hard comparison to make, right? We're in very different stages of stand development. You've got very different structures out on that forest. 
just based on the tree ages and sizes. And so SDI is the tool that will let you compare that. What it does is you can imagine that it grows the two inch diameter stand through stem exclusion. You get a lot of density dependent mortality as those trees get up to 10 inches in size. And then it tells us this is how many 10 inch trees you would have per acre at a stand of equivalent stocking to what you have right here. Imagine our older stand with the 50, 20 inch trees per acre. Imagine moving it back in time to the point where it had more trees and they were 10 inches in size. And it says, this is the stocking of 10 inch trees that would equal that stocking you've got in these 20 inch trees per acre. Because you can fit more little trees per acre, you can fit fewer big trees per acre. They take up size, they use site resources, okay? And so now we can make a direct comparison of those two stands and we can say, hey, this one has higher stocking, this one has lower stocking. And we can start figuring out more about how those stands will grow in the future or how those stands may have grown. Now let's explain the 1.605 and where that came from. But to do that, we need to use logarithms, okay? And so these two graphs are showing you the exact same data. The only difference is that the axis on the graph on the left is incremental and the axis on the graph on the right is logarithmic. And so we're used to the graph on the left, where if it is an inch between those tick marks, an inch on the bottom of the graph, an inch on the top of the graph is the same difference. In this case, 10,000, okay? But look at the logarithmic graph on the right. If you look at the, say it's two inches between those tick marks, the two inches at the bottom is the difference between one and 10. The two inches at the top is the difference between 10,000 and 100,000. So it's a difference of nine at the bottom, but at the top of this graph, it's a difference of 90,000. So between each of those tick marks, you multiply the previous tick mark by 10, because this is a base 10 logarithm I'm using here. So logarithms are, are kind of confusing mathematically if you haven't looked at them for a while, but we use them for a few important reasons. And some of those are really more historical relics. So uh, as we look at these data, you have an exponential growth trend on the left, and by using that logarithmic axis, we make it nice and linear. So back when Dr. Colhavy was working on his master's thesis, if he wanted to graph data, he would take his data, and there's no computers, so he would take it on campus to what's literally the graphics department, and the graphics department would hand draw his graphs. Well, if you're working in the graphics department, you're accurately drawing graphs, which of those would you rather draw? The straight line's a lot easier to draw, right? Okay. And so that's sort of a historical reason why we use logarithms on graphs. Um, even today though, it's, it's easier to mathematically work with that line on the right because it's a straight line. Now we can use y equals mx plus b, our equation for a straight line, where y is the y-axis, x is the x-axis, m is the slope, and b is the intercept. And so the math becomes a lot simpler after you convert that to a logarithm. Okay, now Dr. Colhavy's early career, mid eighties, and we're using old school computers well, they weren't too good at carrying numbers out to a lot of decimal places. It would cause computational errors. If you take a logarithm of a really big number, it makes it a much smaller number. And so by doing that, we could use them computationally and computers would work better. Um, we have much faster chips today, less of an issue, but there's sort of the two historical relics reasons why we, we used to use a lot of logarithms. But even today, you know, they're pretty handy. So here's where that gets us to that 1.605. What I have here for you is a figure that Schnur put together using these similar ideas in 1937. The y-axis here is quadratic mean diameter. It wouldn't have to be QMD. It could be volume per tree. It could be weight per tree. You just need some metric of individual tree size. The x-axis is trees per acre. Both of them are on a logarithmic scale. And so this looks really complicated, but what's happening here is very simple, okay? How many one inch diameter trees can I fit per acre? A few or a lot? A lot. How many 20 inch diameter trees can I fit per acre? A few or a lot? A few. You can fit fewer big trees per acre. What's the process we've been going over all semester that gets us from a lot of little trees per acre to a few big trees per acre? STEM exclusion. And what's happening in STEM exclusion? What's the key process in STEM exclusion? Mortality, mortality and what type of mortality? Density-dependent density dependent mortality. All this complicated figure is showing you is density-dependent mortality. 
And what you find is if you plant 500 trees per acre or you get naturally regenerated 500 trees per acre, they'll grow in stand initiation for a while. You don't get much mortality. And then they hit those diagonal lines and they move up and to the left along those diagonal lines. So as you move up on this figure, your trees are getting bigger. And as you move to the left, you're getting fewer trees per acre. You're simulating density dependent mortality where the losers are dying out and the winners are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you're getting fewer trees per acre. Now, when Reinecke did this and when Schnur did this, they found slopes on these log log plots. You know, you can see it's down and to the right there. And so it's a negative slope. They found them and they were always somewhere around negative 1.5. So negative 1.5 is the same as negative three halves. So we call that the negative three halves power law. Okay, so that's the negative three halves power law. Other than it depends, it's the closest thing we have in silviculture to some sort of universal law. Now it won't always be negative three halves exactly because you can see when Reinecke did it, he found 1.605. Pretty close to three halves, but not quite. Now I said it's negative and here you can see that exponent is positive. But remember if I take a fraction and I make an exponent on that whole fraction, positive or negative, it just flips the fraction. So I could write this equation as trees breaker times 10 divided by QMD raised to the negative 1.605. And mathematically, it's exactly the same. Okay, so there's the negative 1.605 is about negative three halves. So that's why it's, it's there. It's reflecting how we see trees occupying sites and just physically how many of them we can fit on an acre of land. That's what it's showing you. Okay, so we'll talk about stand density management diagrams in a bit. That was the third bullet point on that list, but that's a simple stand density management diagram. So we've already seen a very simple one. Okay, so that's SDI. That's why everything fits in that SDI equation. That's how you interpret it. So what units could we put on this SDI equation? How would you say what the units are there? So what is SDI representing? So it's the density of the stand in what units? Trees per acre. So the units on it could be trees per acre at what diameter? 10 inches. So the simplest way to put units on SDI is just trees per acre at 10 inches, okay? So that's what SDI is telling us. So for SDI to be useful, we need to know the biological carrying capacity of different species. So you need to figure out the maximum SDI within a region. So here you go. Um, there's a table of a number of different maximum SDIs, the maximum biological carrying capacity of sites. You need to memorize three of these numbers this semester. Um, these will be fair game for quizzes and I will not give them to you. So upland hardwoods, 230. So that's saying you can fit 230 upland hardwoods on an acre of land at a 10 inch diameter. That's what that means. Loblolly pine 450. And then longleaf, shortleaf and slash pine, our other three southern yellow pines are 400. So that's what we're gonna be using this semester. You need to memorize those three numbers. Loblolly's 450, the other southern yellow pines are 400, hardwoods are 230, okay? So now that we know what SDI is and we know what the maximum SDI is, that leads us to relative density. We can define relative density in a number of different ways, but we're gonna use a relative density in this form. So we can calculate the actual SDI. That's gonna be easy to do because you can go out, you can cruise a stand and you all can very easily now calculate trees per acre, basal area per acre and quadratic mean diameter. That's what you need to calculate SDI. So you calculate the actual SDI of a stand. All you do is divide it by that maximum number on that previous table, and that's relative density. Okay, so I have a Lavalli pine stand with an SDI of 110. What's my relative density? So a bunch of you have calculators sitting out there. What's the max SDI on lob? 450, so what's the equation? 110 over 450, which gives you 24%. Okay, so now we know relative density is 24%. We still don't know, should I thin that standard or not, right? We need to know a little bit more. 
So here are some very useful benchmarks, okay? Crown closure in natural stands occurs at a relative density of about 15%. In plantations, it will occur at a higher relative density because you planted those stands at a wider spacing than natural regeneration would occur. Yeah, Will. What's that? Yeah, so uh, relative density is just SDI divided by max SDI. That's all it is. Okay, for imminent mortality, we call this sort of the zone of imminent mortality, the line of Im imminent mortality, uh, the zone of self thinning. We call this all sorts of different things, but it's just the idea that trees are dying due to density dependent mortality. It's the process we've been talking about all semester that tends to occur between 55 and 60%. Okay. So if you've got a stand with relative density above 55%, what sort of treatment are you thinking about doing? Thinning, okay? So now think about that scenario at the beginning of class, that stand where you had a basal area, a tree spray acre and a QMD, you could plug those numbers in, calculate SDI, divide it by max SDI we're using for hardwoods 230, and you could all come to the same answer on biologically, does that stand need to be thinned or not? Uh, what sort of mortality are we gonna start seeing in that stand? We could all come up with the exact same answer now. So this is a very powerful tool. For Southern yellow pine, we try to manage them within an SDI range of 30 to 45% of their maximum SDI. So we just got 25% for this hypothetical lava and pine stand. Should you thin it? No, no. It, it's below where we'd like it to be, let it grow. Maybe it's a stand that needs to be fertilized, but you don't need to be thinning it right now. Realistically, we'll bounce outside both limits of that 30 to 45% range because SDI relative density, we're purely talking about the ecology and biology of the forest. We're not talking about the economics or the operations. If you tried to manage a stand just in that narrow relative density range, what would result usually is you would thin it more frequently and lighter. And so operationally, that doesn't tend to work out. So you may bump up into 50, 60%. You might thin it back down to, you know, 25, 30%, but you're probably exceeding that range due to operational constraints. But ecologically, that's what the trees would like, okay, for you to do a lot of frequent low intensity things. So that's relative density. And make sure you know those three different thresholds on this slide as well because without them, those SDI numbers don't really mean much. But now think about this. I tell you a stand has a 70% relative density. You can get a mental picture of that stand in your head with just one number. You know that there's a lot of trees dying, you know it's at a high stocking, and you can predict what you need to do. So these are really, really powerful tools. Okay, so next up is a stand density management diagram. And again, that Schnur diagram we looked at, that was already a stand density management diagram to explain that negative three halves power law. Um, here's another one that Drew and Fuelling came up with in Douglas firm. So what I have on the y-axis here is mean tree volume. How many cubic feet do you have in a tree? The y-axis is trees per acre. Both those axes are logarithmic. Okay, so we have a log log plot. Each line you see on there is a Douglas fir stand they tracked out over time. And you'll notice they all go up and then they all hockey stick to the left. That's density dependent mortality in these pure even age stands. And then you see that line they drew on there, that solid line that the stands, none of them seem to exceed that line. That's maximum SDI plotted out on this diagram. And I know that text is small, but if you look at it and you read it, the equation ends with minus 1.5 times the natural log of trees per acre. So it's following that negative three halves power law. So Reinecke found it in a bunch of different stands. Schnur found it in Upland Oaks. Drew and Fuelling found it in Douglas Fir out west. Um, I had a grad student, Sam Camarillo here, and we looked at data from a bunch of bottomland hardwood plots north of the Neches River. Same thing, okay? We see this over and over and over again, that negative three halves power law or something close to it, 1.4, 1.6, something in that range keeps playing out over time. So this is a simple density management diagram. And I say simple, you're gonna see how complicated these diagrams are. If you wanna look at one up closer, again, look at the back of that lab handout you have now, that, that's about as complex as they get. 
Okay, here's another simple stand density management diagram. This is for Wabali Pond in Louisiana. Um, so here we have the average diameter on a logarithmic scale on the y axis. We have trees per acre on a logarithmic scale on the x axis. And you have two stands there stand A and stand B. Stand A is on a better site index than stand B. So a better site index, you can carry more trees per acre, right? At any given size. And here you see they plotted out the maximum SDI line at 400 there. So they were going a little lower than that 450. So this could vary regionally, right? Um, and then they're plotting out the lower limit of self thinning at an SDI of 220. See that dotted line at 220? What's the relative density there? What's 220 divided by 400? Fifty-five percent relative density. So there it is again, right? So there's the lower limit of self thinning where we expect mortality to occur. And look at the lines; they don't hockey stick to the left until they exceed that, and then they go parallel to it due to density dependent mortality occurring. So the trees are still growing; they're moving up, but you're getting fewer of them. They're moving to the left. Okay, do you see time on there anywhere? Time is not graphed out on any of these. Okay, so that higher quality site, the line A, we know it's going to grow faster, right? Because it's got a higher site index. So it probably moves up that line quicker than the stand that's moving up that line on B. Time is not on this. Okay, this is showing you stand structure, but this is not showing you stand ages. This is not showing you time in any way. Here's where these stand density management diagrams start becoming useful. Okay. Um, and so this is Douglas fir in New Zealand, again, back to Drew and Fluelling's work. And see those lines where they suddenly angle up and to the left, and then after that they go straight up again? That line angling up and to the left is a thinning, okay? Um, so as you review the density management one lecture, we talk about the impacts of different types of thinning on the diameters of stands. See how those lines that represent the thinning um, move up and to the left? And so as we look at these diagrams, let me see if I can. So that's going to be this line right here. This line is a thin. This line is a thin. This line right here is a thin. OK, so when they do those thins, they may only be doing that thin for a week or two where the logger is out in the stand. See how the quadratic mean diameter increased or the mean tree size increased? It went up on the y-axis. OK, so they did a type of thin that left bigger trees out on this stand than when they went into the woods, which means they put what size trees on the log trucks? They put smaller trees on the log trucks. What type of thin is that? Those are low thins, OK? So those are low thins. If they had done a third row thin, so they did a geometric thin, what we, we expect those thinning lines to look like. Parallel to the x-axis, horizontal, because it's not changing diameter, because they took a third of the big trees, a third of the small trees, and a third of the average size trees. They didn't change diameter, OK? Keep that in mind for the stand density management diagram exercise you all are going to be doing this week. And that is included in the video um, that you'll see going over what you're going to do on that. Okay, here again is the diagram for Wabalai Pine in Louisiana. They've added more stuff to that. So these diagrams get more complicated. They've added average stand height on here. They've added more SDIs. They put some indicators of stand volumes on there. But you can see those lines that they've plotted out there. And it, these diagrams turn into an optical illusion, right? It's, it's hard to start seeing things on there. It's like a, one of those old magic eyes or something. Um, but as you look at this, they've plotted out about four different thinning scenarios where they look at heavier or lighter thins. And so this tool is telling you, hey, some mortality is going to occur. Here's where we expect it to occur. So as you do these different types of thins, you know, you're preventing that mortality. You're capturing that mortality. So what type of thin is going to be best? And that brings us to this diagram for slash pine uh, that Tom Dean and Eric Jokola came up with. That's on the back of your packet there. And that's what you're working with in lab this week. And we're not going to use all the lines on there. We're really going to be focused on trees per acre. So that's our x-axis. We're going to be focused on QMD. So that's our y-axis. And then the only other lines we're going to be using on there are the ones that are parallel to the cutoff corner in the top right there. 
those horizontal line, or those diagonal lines are following the negative three halves power law. So that's showing us density dependent mortality. Okay, we're going to kind of ignore the rest of the lines on here and just do a simpler approach on here. So, any questions so far on density management diagrams? And again, you have a whole video up for lab. I emailed you the link yesterday that contains how you work your way through this and what you need to do to use it. So. Okay, um, so next up is Gingrich style stocking charts. Uh, so Gingrich came up with these in 1968. Um, these are gonna be a little friendlier to use because they always look something like this one. They're not as variable as those stand density management diagrams. And if you look at these axes, are those logarithmic axes on here? These do not contain logarithmic axes. So they're, you know, more, more, most of us are more comfortable using these sort of style diagrams, okay? So on Gingrich stocking guides, the x-axis is always trees per acre and the y-axis is always basal area. So x-axis is trees per acre, the y-axis is basal area. And so as we look at that, if you have trees per acre and basal area, there's one equation relating trees per acre and basal area with QMD. We've seen our other equation. We've used this a bunch of times now, right? Where you have QMD equals the square root of basal area over trees per acre all over 0 0.005454. So we know that trees per acre and basal area, if I give you those two, it is equal to one and only one QMD. You can't just make up a QMD at those. So if you know any two of these, you can calculate the third. So as we look back at this Gingrich style stocking chart, See the diagonal lines that go from bottom left to upper right? They radiate out from zero, zero. Those are QMD lines. So as you look at this diagram, the QMD line on the bottom there, it's hard to see what it's labeled. Um, I believe that's the six inch QMD line. The one that goes right through those words, overstocked, fully stocked and understocked, that's the 10 inch QMD line. And so if you think about it, if you have a stand that has no basal area, no trees breaker, QMD equals zero. So all these lines will hit zero, zero. They just haven't extended them that far. And so these diagrams are handy because if you want to know what a QMD is and you don't want to do that calculation, but you've got one of these, just look at your basal area, look at your trees breaker, and it'll tell you about what your QMD is just graphically and visually, okay? Then you have the lines that slope from top left down to bottom right. Those are your stocking lines, okay? And this is where this is handy. We could have used this diagram for that scenario at the beginning of class, where when you plot a basal area and you plot a tree's breaker, it'll tell you, is that stand overstocked, adequately stocked, or is that stand understocked? And then you can make decisions on thinning and how much to thin it. So there are a bunch of different diagrams for different scenarios. This is in your useful handouts packet. These are two diagrams, A and B, but what you'll notice is diagram B it goes only zero to about 275 trees per acre and the basal area only goes 40 to 140. So it's kind of a really zoomed in small piece of diagram A. So once you get bigger trees, you can see how all the diameters get scrunched up real close to the X axis there. So they've just kind of zoomed in on it. You could stitch all these together and make them one diagram. It would just be harder to use for those bigger trees. And so on this, you can see that B line kind of goes up at an angle. And so we need to go over what all these different lines mean on this diagram. Gingrich came up by, with these by um, looking at, at the crowns of different trees and coming up with competition factors between them. And he used those calculated competition factors to make decisions on how many of them you could fit per acre. So it's all based on a growing space or a site occupancy model. But here's the meaning. So we have an A, B and a C line on there. If you're at the A line, you're at full stocking. If you're above the A line, you're overstocked, okay? So that's how you interpret it. If you're on the B line, your stand is fully occupying that site and using all the site resources and it's growing well, there's not much mortality. Between the A line and the B line, your stand is fully stocked, okay? So you're not getting much mortality. You're fully occupying the growing space. Between the A line and the B line, that's our management zone. That's where we want to manage our stands. At the C line, you are understocked. Anywhere below the B line, you're understocked. But at the C line, it has a specific definition. 
on an average quality site, it will take you 10 years to grow that stand back to hit the B line. So on an average quality site, it's gonna take you 10 years to go from understocked back to adequately stocked. On a higher quality site, it'll happen quicker. On a lower quality site, it'll happen slower, okay? So that's our definition of the A, B, and C lines on these diagrams. So I told you we're gonna be using A, B, C, D, E a bunch of different times. So there's your A, B, and C for these stocking guides. Um, when you, you know, looking at lecture, density management lecture one, we talked about D over D ratios. So there's D used twice in two different contexts. So we're using all these A, B, C, D letters over and over and over again. So just keep track of what we're actually talking about when you start seeing these. So stocking guides basically show how much a site is occupying growing space um, and then how much we can remove without wasting growing space. If you thin a stand too heavily, you leave open areas where the water nutrients and light there are not being used. We don't wanna do that if we're managing for timber. And so when we look at the relationship between basal area and diameter growth, these are lava pine stands and some of them are thin, some of them are unthinned. They follow the same trend, okay? At lower basal areas, you put more diameter growth on those trees. So you'll grow more wood with higher basal areas, but what you're doing is growing a little bit of wood on a large number of trees. At a lower basal area, you grow less wood, but what you're doing is growing more wood on fewer number of trees. All of that can fit into the management zone between the A and the B lines. But on the left of this, you're growing saw timber quickly, probably. On the right of this, you may be growing pulp wood slowly. So are you gonna grow a lot of smaller trees more slowly or are you gonna grow a lesser number of larger trees more quickly? That's sort of the trade-off with how much basal area you wanna leave on a stand. So let's break this down a little bit more. Above the A-line, we've got stands that are overstocked. Individual tree growth is slow, lots of mortality, and so you're gonna see that stand hockey stick to the left. You're gonna see basal area continue to go up gradually as trees break or are reduced. Trees are dying, density dependent mortality has occurred. So as you look at this photo of this stand right here, that looks pretty darn dense, right? That's actually a loblolly pine stand. Do you, anybody ever seen a loblolly pine stand like that? That would be awesome. If we could grow loblolly like this in East Texas, that would be absolutely awesome. That's loblolly pine. That would be way overstocked in the US. We never see stands like this because trees die. That's loblolly pine in Brazil. So overstocked in the Southern US is good stocking in Brazil. They can fit more of them per acre because the climate is more suitable. And then a lot of the native insects and diseases that impact loblolly pine here in the South aren't present in Brazil. So you've removed them from all their native uh, predators um, and pests. So, so yeah, that would, the technical term for that is a wall of wood. Okay, between the A and the B line, stands are fully stocked. Total growth per acre is about the same anywhere in that zone, as long as you're talking about trees in the same region on similar sites with similar composition. But again, you can manipulate how the diameter rates accrete there, how they grow on those trees. To the left of a density management diagram, you have a few trees putting on diameters quickly. To the right, you have more trees putting on diameters more slowly. But that's your opportunity. Let your stand grow up to the A-line, thin it back to the B-line. Grow it up to the A-line, thin it back to the B-line. So it tells you when it's time to thin, and it tells you how much to thin. So it's a very useful diagram. Here's an aerial image of a stand between the B and the C-line, and you can see ground that's not being used to grow trees. So your stand is understocked. Diameter growth on the trees that are there are probably very rapid, but you're not putting on as many tons per acre per year as you could, okay? So not much mortality, but also not as much growth as that site has potential for. Now, if you're below the C line, it's gonna take you more than 10 years to get back to the B line. You either had severe disturbances out there, um, mortality events like insects, disease, um, you've had a logger that did something you really didn't want them to do. Um, and so in an extreme example, it may start looking like this. What have we talked about this semester that that picture would remind you of? A seed tree. So if you're really far below the C line, your choice is probably let's regenerate this and start over. 
Because if you already have some trees that big out there, is it going to be easy to interplant that and get those trees growing well? You're still going to get suppression effects from those bigger trees that are out there. So if you want to manage even age stands for timber, your best bet in a scenario like this is probably clear cut it and restart your rotation. So. Okay, so stocking guides vary by a lot of different factors. They vary by species. We can't use one stocking guide for all species because species vary in all these different silvical attributes. You saw those lava -like pines in Brazil. So these stocking guides will vary by region um, and they can even vary by management objectives. So they can be complex, they can be more simple. So you see the diagram developed by goals on the right for bottomland hardwoods. It's relatively simple. On the left is a more complicated diagram to be used in Pennsylvania for Allegheny hardwoods. And you can see they have five A lines and four B lines on there. And it's just looking at the blend of cherry ash and poplar that you have. So they're putting different stocking lines on there so you can adjust it for different compositions within your forest. So you can make these real complex, you can make these real simple. Let's talk about how you can use these to plant a thinning. So you can see the red zigzag line on there amidst the rest of those black lines. And what this is plotting out is a stand growing. So it grows straight up from 400 trees per acre. It gets up near the A line, a little over the A line. And then that line that goes down into the left where it's on top of our seven inch QMD line, that's a thin. What type of thin was that? So what type of thin? It's a geometric thin, why? Yeah, it didn't change our QMD, right? So look at a Gingrich diagram. A Gingrich diagram is different than a stand density management diagram. In a stand density management diagram, we had tree size on the Y axis and we had trees per acre on the X axis. In a Gingrich stocking guide, we have trees per acre on the X axis and basal area on the Y axis. What type of thinning increases basal area immediately? None of them, okay? So if you have a thin drawn on this diagram, it always needs to go down. What type of thinning doesn't change the number of trees per acre you have immediately? None of them. So if you have a thinning on this diagram, it always needs to go to the left. So all your thinnings are gonna be lines down and to the left. If they parallel the QMD lines, they don't change QMD, so it was a row thin. If you see where they go down to the left, but it angles more to the left of what that line's doing. So look at the second thin there. So after that first thin at seven inches QMD, your stand grows up to a QMD of about eight and a half inches. And then see that long downward line there? It increased QMD, see that? What type of thin was that? That was a low thin. By removing small trees, you increased QMD, okay? And as we went over in the density management part one lecture, we know for a typical grade C low thin in the south, it increases the diameter by a factor of 1.09. So if that stand had a QMD of eight and a half inches before the grade C low thin, we multiply it by 1.09. And so we know it's increasing QMD by about three quarters of an inch. So we add that and there you go. That's how you figure out the QMD after a low thin. QMD after a row thin is very easy. It doesn't change. So that's pretty straightforward. So when you're plotting out that row thin there, okay, so it looks like the row thin, that first thin went from 400 trees per acre to 300 trees per acre. And it went from, looks like about 100 and just under 110 square feet per acre of basal area down to 80 square feet per acre of basal area. Was it a first row thin, second row thin, third row thin, fourth row thin? What was it? So which one? So if it's a fifth row thin and we started with 400 trees per acre, we would expect to lose 20% of them. So we would lose 80 trees per acre, leaving us with 320. But this took us from 400 to 300 trees per acre. It's a fourth row thin. So we lost 25% of our trees. 25% of 400 is 100 trees per acre. Sure enough, we lost 100 trees per acre. So you can even look on here and to see what row thin that they did. If it's purely a row thin. Of course, if we did a row plus low thin, our typical operation, it would increase QMD slightly because you're probably removing smaller trees in the down rows. 
um, it wouldn't increase it quite as much, not by that full factor of 1.09. And you would actually remove more than a quarter of the stand in an operational fourth growth bed. So this is a little bit theoretical in our application right here. Okay, our last tool is live crown ratio. And the idea here is if a shade intolerant tree gets too low of a live crown ratio or portion of the height of the total stem that has live branches with live leaves on them, that tree is suppressed. That tree has been shaded out, it's competed for too long and it doesn't have a big enough crown to respond well to a thin. Um, and so if you see trees below a live crown ratio of 25%, growth is severely limited. And because growth is severely limited, they may not be very capable to respond to a thin and continue growing. Um, if you, it drops to a third, 33%, you need to thin a live olive pine stand, 40% or higher, and you're in good shape. Here's the problem with this concept. Loblaw pine will always carry between 25 and 30 feet about of live crown. So the shade intolerance of loblaw pine is such that light moving through the top 20 or 25 feet of the crown will start killing anything below that. So they'll carry 25 to 30 feet of live crown. So if I have a 60 foot tall tree that's doing well, I might have a 50% live crown ratio, okay? But if I have a 100 foot tall tree, that's doing pretty well. Well, now I'm at this 25%. It looks like it's limited, but it's not. I just have a really tall tree. So those numbers will work, but they're only really probably gonna work well for you below like 75 feet or so. Um, they're not gonna work for taller trees that you would tend to find in older stands. So. so this is a quick one, unlike any of those others. All those others, you have to go out and put plots, collect data and analyze that data to use them. With this, you just walk out there and you look at a tree with a clino or, or a laser range finder or whatever equipment you've got, a hypsometer. And you say the tree's 60 feet tall and the top 30 feet has a live crown. We're good. That's not suggesting that stand needs to be thin. You go out there, that tree's 40 feet tall. We only have 10 feet of live crown on it. You know there's a problem there. Those trees are competing too much with one another. And you're not gonna just see the live crowns. You're gonna see how many trees there are per acre. You're gonna see their size. So you're gonna see everything else in that stand as well. So it's just one rough indicator. So, so those are our five tools, SDI, relative density, standards and management diagrams, Inger stocking charts, um, and live crown ratio that you can use to decide when to thin a stand um, and how much to thin it by. So now that we've talked about all that, let me roll all the way back to the beginning here. Okay. There's that data. Should we thin that stand? So what's the max SDI for hardwoods? 230. 230. So see what you think. So density is 160 trees per acre. QMD is 12 inches. And let me move it to this slide for you. 12 inch QMD, 160 trees per acre. And then you either need a scientific calculator or phones or other calculators may have a little button that says Y superscript X. That's how you can raise one number to an exponent that's not just squaring it or something like that. QMD is 12 inches, trees per acre is 160 trees per acre. So what's our SDI on this stand? 214, max SDI was 230. So we are up there. What's 214 over 230? 93%. So are some of the trees dying in that stand? Oh yeah. So that's probably a really good site. If we're that close to max SDI, that's probably a really good site, but should you thin it? Yeah, you should definitely thin that stand. Okay, now we got such a high number because that 230 is upland hardwoods in the central hardwoods region. Um, again, Sam Camarillo measuring those plots along the Neches found that some of our bottomland hardwoods may have a max SDI closer to even like 485. So it could be even higher than pines, but that makes sense in our bottomland hardwoods with water willow, laurel oak. You know, we've got some pretty productive sites. So what's that uh, 214 divided by 485? Four 
44%, okay? So for a bottomland hardwood situation like that, we may be right in the sweet spot right now. So should you thin it if 485 was the max SDI? No, okay? Let it grow for a little bit longer, but we know we're getting closer to that 55% where we get the onset of imminent mortality. So we're getting close to needing a thin, but we're not quite there yet. So you need the right max SDI for your species in your region, but once you have it, pretty powerful tool, okay? So are there any questions on uh, density management? 